The other day, one of my BSc <laughs> students uh, from another university comes up and says, uh, Prika, uh, how did you become a surgeon? I knew the answer to it, but I pretended to think for a little while. I've been asked this many times, and the very simple answer is, by accident. I always wanted to become a scientist, indeed, uh, I had a fellowship to go to the Harvard School of Immunology. And when I announced that to my the then surgical chief, the next thing that happened is he called my dad and said, your son has the hands of a surgeon. In those days, there were no mobile phones, of course. The next thing is I follow the family tradition. Dad says, look, you can't really go away to Harvard. What the hell will you do doing immunology? Uh, you got the hands of a surgeon. Uh, so I end up doing what my dad and my chief wants me to do, entirely an accident. But many years later, uh, I think we have come around to the fact that I'm enjoying both sides, being a surgeon and being an immunologist. This is uh, Guy's. Guy's and Tommy's have thousand years of history jointly. And again, I ended up in Guy's largely because of my dad saying, you should be a guy's man. Uh, my, 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 dad is, my dad is the typical Indian. He was himself a computer scientist. And, uh, you know, to him, being a UCL man or some other man, which someone overseas hadn't heard about, was just not right. And he said, guy's man? Absolutely. You should only be a guy's man. And he boasts to all his friends uh, about this when he goes around walking. Uh, every morning at the age of 83. The reason I'm telling you about him is because of the Wickham legacy. John Wickham, uh, truly the father of robotic surgery, uh, was also towards the end of his career a guy's man. And as many of you will know, he passed away at the age of 90 on the 26th of October. And there's a blog on the BJUI site. Some of you will remember him, and I encourage you to read the blog and perhaps add your comments to remember this great man. So here are the challenges, as Freddie says, I should talk about. The first challenge is your mind. And Richard Bell and I were discussing it this morning. We both have the same Bible. I didn't know Richard had the same Bible. But this is a book by a Booker Prize winner, Haruki Murakami. And it says, uh, what I talk about when I talk about running. This is an amazing man who starts off by describing his preparation for the New York Marathon, uh, which was also my first marathon in 2008. So, so uh, no problems in getting inspiration from Haruki. And I say this to everyone embarking on any career, particularly if you have multiple balls in the air. Pain is inevitable. Suffering is optional. So it depends on how much you're willing to suffer. Because the pain will be there. You can't control it. The suffering you can. And it's up to you how much you suffer. If you remember this, as a young surgeon, whichever stage of your career you are in, you'll be just fine even in your darkest or your happiest hours. So here is the first challenge that I face. Integrity. As Freddie said, I took over the BJUI from John Fitzpatrick, the late John Fitzpatrick, five years ago. John was alive at the time. Suddenly died of a brain hemorrhage while exercising in his home gym. There was an outpouring of grief after that. John's uh, blog is the most read blog on the BJUI. Uh, visited some 60,000 times. Most Lancet papers are not read 60,000 times, I can tell you that. But John's blog was. And many people said, look, 
you have to get away from industry. So I said, look, I will not just get away from industry because that's in my contract, absolutely no conflicts of interest, but I will not make a single penny from the BJUR. I don't say this publicly, but you've asked me a question. All the money, the million pounds from the journal, straight away go into KCL. They buy my time. The contract is with the university, and I do the BJUI in my waking hours, despite having to do it every day. So I do not do this as an additional piece of work where I'm trying to create something in the evenings or in the nights because the quality is just not good enough. And then you have the additional conflict of money. So integrity is the first challenge I faced. And I think I have lived up to it because I absolutely can stand here, put my hands up and say, I have no conflicts of interest, zero. I can't say I have no bias, but I have no conflicts. The second is time management. Before I took over the journal, it was very much like Freddy's, although everyone will say Freddy probably does everything full time. But I think most academics would have a 50-50 contract. When I took the BJUI, I went into one third, one third, and one third. One third is clinical, one third is academic, and the other third is the journal. Although you could argue I do most of them full time, but you can't. You have to dedicate your time to what you're doing. If you're writing a grant and have a problem where someone's knocking on your door and saying, could you please come and help with this operation? Unless it's an emergency, you don't. That's your grant writing time. Likewise, when I'm in the BJUI office, I'm off-site. I'm never on call and no one disturbs me. You have to give it time and that's how I have divided myself. And the third is inspiring others. Some say, well, this is just delegation. It actually isn't. And as I keep talking to you, I hope you will appreciate that truly what we have done is about inspiring others. I have very, very little interest in myself as long as I can help others do well, provide an environment for others to do well, I'm happy. I have no interest in what happens to me. So the one underpinning theme, as I said, I became a surgeon by accident. I always wanted to be a scientist. Everything that I've done in those three formats, clinical innovation, research and education, and publishing, has one theme that runs through it, and that is science. I've always tried to be scientific. I've always tried to maintain integrity, and I hope that the challenge of putting science at the middle of three completely disparate bits of living is what I have tried to achieve, and perhaps succeeded in a little way. So let me take you through a few examples, because the theme is challenges, and I'll take you through a few examples. So this is now almost 25 years old, easily my most significant contribution to science. This science, this is a little uh, bladder biopsy. This is taken in an awake patient. And what it shows you here are a whole load of nerves. When you look at this under electron microscope, there are a whole load of nerves here. What I haven't told you is this is from a patient with a neurogenic bladder who is incontinent all the time and who has failed every treatment. This was the first demonstration of a particular kind of nerve fiber called C fiber in a human being. It had been described by a scientist called Chet de Groot in cats, but Claire Fowler, who is now retired from the Institute of Neurology in Queen Square, and I were the first to describe these C fibers, and this is that first description. The C fibers are easily remembered because they have a receptor called the TRIP-V1 receptor. TRIP is transient receptor potential. V stands for vanilloids. Vanilloids have nothing to do with vanilla. Vanilloids have everything to do with chilies. Chilies contain vanilloids, and therefore this receptor is called the TRIP-V1 or the vanilloid receptor. 
And we realize that these nerves are exquisitely sensitive uh, to capsaicin, or a solution of semi-synthetic chilies. And it took us many years to realize that they're also exquisitely sensitive to botulinum toxin. Indeed, uh, this, I am told, has now transformed the lives of five million incontinent people worldwide because it's undergone a number of trials, phase one and phase two, and it now has a license in refractory overactive bladder. It was, uh, strangely enough, named by, after me uh, by Claire and Arun Sahai, who is now a colleague at Guy's. And when they published this paper uh, in 2006, uh, I refused to put my name on it because I just could not accept uh, that somewhere where they were describing something associated with me or had my name on it uh, would have me as a co-author. I just refused. And I'm glad I did because this has now entered various textbooks and I think will easily re uh, remain my strongest contribution to translational science. But again, no conflicts at all. I didn't name something after myself. And we need to be absolutely clear about that. But then, around this time, a young man, and this is about the challenge of inspiring others, a young man called Ben Chalicum, who many of you will know, again now a colleague, uh, turns up at Guy's saying, I hear you have gone on from being a senior registrar to a senior academic. I said, well, I'm only a junior academic. I just started. He said, I want to do some research in robotics with you. I said, Ben, I don't have any money. I only just started. So he comes up with this idea of a randomized trial between Guys and Hopkins, the first such randomized trial, and we name it Star Trek. Star Trek stands for Systematic transatlantic randomized telerobotic access to the kidney. <coughs> nice name, inspired by Star Trek, of course. So uh, very simple. Doesn't matter that this was a machine for removing kidney stones. Uh, it could be for making broad beans, as far as I'm concerned. It is the principle. These are 300 procedures half robotic, half standard, manual insertion of a needle from the skin to the kidney, and then the needle is dilated, the needle track to take the stones out. The robot is first in London, controlled from the United States, 5,000 miles away. In those days, we didn't have high-speed lines, I can assure you. Uh, now it's a completely different ball game. And then we switch, and the machine goes to Hopkins, the surgeon is at Guy's. Rather than bore you with the statistics, it showed a very simple philosophy, which was the robot was slower, but more accurate than the human hand. So even before we had any Da Vinci, uh, any company telling us that their product was excellent, we decided to embark on this randomized trial because uh, I was always interested in evaluation, not hype, and actually, uh, when we got our first 1.1 million, the grant uh, said very clearly, this is for establishing a robotics group, but also evaluating robotics. We're talking about 2002. Yeah? And it was based on the Star Trek trial, because I didn't go to anyone and say, give me some money, uh, because that's what our American colleagues were doing. In fact, they were busily writing checks. Uh, we couldn't do that in the UK. So here is uh, my journey and the challenge of showing what clinical innovation can do, and perhaps the challenge also of accepting when you might not quite have been right, thinking what you thought all the way. So this is uh, comparing open or ORC, radical cystectomy, standard of care. We've been talking about cystectomies that have happened in Oxford two days ago with my uh, friend, uh, and comrade Jim Cato coming to help you here, the other editor of uh, the other lovely European journal, European Urology. Jim and I love each other to bits. So what about comparing open radical cystectomy versus laparoscopic or LRC versus robotic? Look, this is a paper uh, which came out now five years ago 
we were undoubtedly uh, one of the first groups in the world to do this operation with uh, robotic surgery. And we show here, as in the pink box, that the complications reduced from 65% to 37% and further to 27%. Freddie, this is looking pretty good, yeah? You could sell this to anybody, even in Oxford, couldn't you? Yeah, perfect. Everyone bought into this. The NHS said they would pay an additional tariff. The patient said they were delighted. I mean, this was fantastic. We sold it to everyone. We even, with Kurshid Guru from uh, New York, established what was now called the International Robotic Cystectomy Consortium. Nearly two and a half thousand patients worldwide who had this operation. So this is a registry and nearly 50 papers have come out of this registry internationally. So this takes out the whole business of, oh, one center can do this. Das Gupta is a great surgeon. This takes out all that nonsense. This is international data as it is. It's a registry study. What I haven't told you is around this time, I was invited uh, by the equivalent of the queen here uh, by a king in India, the Maharaja of Jodhpur, to become his visiting professor. So I was the visiting surgeon. This is 20, 2008, 2009. And while I'm in his palace, and I'll never be in a palace ever again, I think I'll better use my time to the best of my ability. So I cook up this trial comparing open laparoscopic robotic and call it the coral study. Cystectomy, open, robotic, and laparoscopic. Wonderful, isn't it? All done in a palace. Of course, I'm thinking we are going to kick the open guys out. You know, laparoscopic, we have already shown we've even reduced it by further 10% as far as complications are concerned. So I'm feeling very confident at this time. Here are the results of the coral trial. The primary outcome, 90-day complication rates exactly the same. This is not the only negative trial of robotic cystectomy. There are three others. All other three are American. There's a paper in the Lancet comparing open to robotic assisted radical prostatectomy. The only trial that succeeded, we tried to run LOPRA, we failed. Freddie was part of the trial management group. The Australian colleagues succeeded. Again, a negative trial. So imagine what a blow it is when 15 years later, having sung all these robotic praises, you finally find you were perhaps not as correct as you thought you were. You have to accept it. Yes, the secondary outcomes show that blood loss is less, pain is less, but the fact is, these were negative trials. And leaves a question mark over where we are with this whole robotic malachi. And the question mark and the answer is very simple. A fool with a tool is still a fool. The outcomes are certainly dependent on the surgeon and not on the technology. And if I can say that, I stress it again and again, surgery really is an art. We try to put it through trials. We think this is oncology. We think, well, yes, we are comparing a drug to another. We aren't. We are comparing one surgeon, one artist, to a whole lot of other artists. That's what we are doing. And if there's one lesson I have learned from the last 15 years about robotics, it is this. The other thing that happened is around the same time, Lakmal Senavi Ratne, a very good roboticist, a scientist, approached me saying, Prika, there are so many shortcomings in robotics, particularly the lack of a sense of touch. And I said, Lakmal, well, uh, a, uh, the company tells us that 3D vision is enough. You don't need the sense of touch. He said, well, that's because the company is telling you. Where is your integrity in all this? I said, I accept it. This is an unmet need. If we didn't need the sense of touch, then all of us would be eating our breakfast this morning with our hands tied behind our backs. 
we wouldn't enjoy breakfast that much, would we? And just because intuitive surgical has been telling us touch doesn't matter, we have accepted it somehow. And some of us go around the world saying, 3D vision, HD, makes all the difference. Touch, who the hell cares? I can do anything without touching it. No science. Zero science. Poppycocks fed by industry because you cannot transmit the sense of touch across a wire pulley system. That's what the modern robot is. You're transmitting across a wire and a pulley and you can't trust, transmit touch as effectively over a wire pulley system. And this is the problem we have in cancers that are palpable, T3 prostate cancers. You look at any registry, the margin rates are 35%. And if I was a patient, I'd be pretty unhappy. So the challenge I think we have, at least to my mind, is to try and re-establish the sense of touch and see if we can reduce margins. So here is haptics. Haptics is the scientific name for the sense of touch. This is a project which started nearly 10 years ago, published this year, where you see here, these are two anterior tumors that my finger couldn't feel. Uh, and I can talk to you about the various different iterations this haptic probe has gone through, through air cushion, water cushion, pseudo haptics, you name it, we have done it in the lab. But this is able to pick up these anterior tumors or indeed any tumors better than a human hand. It can feel better than a human hand. Take a look at this. This is much more recent. This is a haptic glove called the NeuroDigital. You put it on. You don't even have to make an incision on a patient. You put your hands out. You shut your eyes and you can feel raindrops. That's how accurate it is. It's very difficult to simulate the feeling of raindrops when there are none. This can do that. You can actually feel, quote unquote, inside a patient, feel his or her tumor without making a single incision. Amazing, amazing technology currently under evaluation. Now, this is a very interesting story. Imagine taking your iPad and putting it in front of the patient. Imagine being able to see through the patient see the tumor, see the prostate. You can do it to the brain, you can see a brain tumor. Why is today you think this technology, which was developed in our own lab, why is this currently not visible anywhere? It's because industry have purchased this for many million. It's gone underground. This will appear in a new robot uh, somewhere near you in the next five years. You could say, how many million did I make out of it? The answer is zero. I lost two very good scientists to industry, but I personally made absolutely nothing out of it. So a lot of good technology currently that is being developed within the university suddenly goes underground, and the next we hear about it, someone's bought it. And then we find out that these people have left us. This is the new kid on the block. This is of interest because it brings in the ideal framework from Oxford's Balliol College. On the left, you see the first ever 3D printed prostate. There's an anterior tumor here, which is literally uh, a millimeter or so from the sphincter. This patient, no one wanted to operate on him, thinking he's going to become incontinent. He was also worried about his erections because he had a 35-year-old new wife. The now bundles are miles away from this tumor. This is T3 tumor. We've now done an ideal phase 2A study showing that the margins rate in T3 disease in prostatectomy has dropped from 35 to 10%. This is about to be uh, in a randomized trial. We very much hope Oxford will be part of it. 10 centers uh, will be requested to participate. Uh, 300 patients randomized 150 in each arm. The patient will be blinded. The surgeon will receive a box in the morning of the operation. You can't shake the box. This is the blinding because it will be muffed in a way where the only way you know what is inside the box is when you open it. And inside will either be 
a 3D printed prostate where you can actually fill the tumor or a tennis ball. So you can either do standard of care or you can do a 3D print guided prostatectomy. So today what we have is purely a biased ideal phase 2A study. The randomized control trial will be kicking off sometime next year. It's just been approved by the NCRI. So a few final thoughts about uh, robotics. One of the challenges we had is why have just wrists at the end of instruments, which is what the Da Vinci system has. What about the shoulder? What about the elbow? Why can't we have more flexibility? And this is where we got inspiration from an octopus. So we brought in experts from biology, from medicine, uh, from engineering to try and learn from the movements of an octopus. It has flexible tentacles. And this project, which was funded by the EU, uh, is called the Stiff Flop Project. So the machine uh, looks a bit like this. It's a robotic arm, but with a difference. It has artificial intelligence and it learns from a surgeon's mistake. So it has surgical cognition. It actually avoids blood vessels because you've previously been there and made a mistake. So it avoids and learns from your mistakes. So here is a nice little story about inspiring others. The man who designed the flexibility of the arm brought in a technology called granular jamming. And he turns up, is in my lab, he turns up uh, one day from the lab and says, I need to come and show you uh, what we have done because lab is good, we need to use it in your sim lab. So I said, okay, come over to guys. Unfortunately, in London, uh, everything is off-site, space is at a premium, so our robotics lab is at the Strand campus about five miles away. We've tried to move them to the guy's side, there's just no space. So he comes along with this granular jamming arm with the granular jamming concept, and he's very excited. We test it out, and indeed, it moves flexibly. Flexible shoulder, flexible wrist, flexible everything. So I said, look, it's very exciting. What granules have you got in this? And he says, well, sir, coffee granules, of course. So I said, I need to show him something. So I took it, I put it inside the sterilizer, and I switched it on for five minutes. We were having cappuccino afterwards. There's an important lesson in this. If you are trying to do something translational with your scientists, we need to get together from day one. Otherwise, they will have a proof of principle which is clinically useless far down the road. We had to change these granules. Clearly, you can't put coffee granules inside any arm because they are just not going to stand the heat of a sterilizer. We've now changed it. And by the time the full prototype came out last year, this was a fully functioning robotic arm with a form of silicon granules which do not melt. But that's exactly what happened. And we are very proud of what we did. The other challenge we have been facing, particularly with the telegraph uh, day before yesterday saying uh, surgical masks and surgical robots have absolutely cost the NHS 150 million and so on and so forth uh, out of Imperial. I, I hear rumors that uh, my friend Lord Darcy has, is in the process of having a few words with the author of the BGS paper. I don't know what those words are. Maybe he's congratulating him. I have absolutely no idea. But anyway, the Telegraph two days ago said, surgical masks abandoned them, surgical robots. What a load of, uh, et cetera, et cetera, uh, uh, 150 million. So uh, you could argue, uh, well, uh, is cheaper always better? And this is something we have struggled with. Uh, we have tried to develop various economic models. And I've gone around the world saying robotics is not cost effective. It is how you make it cost effective. And the way you do that is compare this to MasterChef. In MasterChef, you are allowed to use the spices that you want in the food. In a Markov model, you take the piece of meat and you can put in whatever spices and vegetables you want, but you're not allowed to choose. You then slow cook it for one to three years, and at the end of it, you smell and you eat it. You have no idea how it's going to smell, 
how it's going to taste. If it tastes good, you say it's cost effective. If it doesn't, you say, well, we made a mistake. And the only way of making robotics cost effective, I think, is to have high volume centers which are doing multi-specialty robotics. You cannot do this in district hospitals doing 50 cases a year. It just doesn't work. And urology alone is not enough. The other problem we have is robotic surgery causing more regret. This is a major challenge that I have faced as a surgical innovator. And if you see why it does that, it is purely because of this. Patients regret robotics because they think they are going to be even more erect after their prostates are removed robotically than they were before the operation. It's not just us, the Americans have done exactly the same. It's in the mind of the patient. We have invested very heavily, and I'll not show you the data, in a pseudo-randomized trial whereby we have invested in counseling the patients through seminars with nurses and psychologists and having a survivorship pathway whereby we counsel them such that those who don't want to have this kind of surgery will go and have something else. And therefore, we then have a group of people who really want this, who are really well counseled. It's almost better to invest in this than the new generation of the robot. Invest in your counselors, your nurses, your psychologists, and your patients will do well because you've won over their minds. A few words then about safe training. When I started, I was almost like the visiting roboticist. I can't remember whether I came to Oxford. I certainly went to Reading at 6 a.m. one morning. I said, look, that's the only time I can turn up. Uh, if you want to do a case, it has to be on table at 6 a.m. And they did, uh, to give them credit, put the patient up in the morning. So I was roaming around the United Kingdom trying to teach people how to do robotics. There was no structure to the whole system. And now we have a structure which is called the Mars Project. This is five European centers who have come together. This is the PhD of Nick Raison, again, inspiring the younger generation uh, to do it safely. And as part of this, what Nick has shown is that doing this, i.e. as surgeons, being good at operating is not enough. We can also improve our skills by training our minds. How about that? A completely new concept where you can train your minds to do better surgery, not just learn how to be a carpenter. So here are the results of a randomized trial where on the left you have cognitive trained surgeons, on the right you have standard trained surgeons, and this is the comparison of technical skills, higher the value on the y-axis, the better the performance. And here is the comparison of non-technical skills like leadership and communication. And to my knowledge, the only such trial in the world looking at this showing that you can actually cognitively train the surgeon because in each of these arms, the cognitive trained surgeons do better than those who have standard training. So again, food for thought, I think quite a new way of training the next generation. Freddie mentioned to you that I ended up doing quite a bit of simulation. Again, this was entirely an accident where Bao said, we need someone to lead our SIM program. This is a randomized controlled international trial. Uh, you can see America, Europe, uh, and Asia, uh, 11 centers and 2,500 patients. This is called the simulate trial. Half the surgeons are SIM trained, the other half are not SIM trained, and we are comparing learning curves and outcomes to actually see whether it makes a difference to patients. So this trial will report in 2019. So this is a major, major trial that has fully recruited and now being followed up uh, out there. The latest in this field is actually trying to improve the communication between the technology and the surgeon rather than the technology itself. And I think the answer is 5G. 5G is not just your current phone, which is 4G. 5G is much beyond that. This is 23 gigabits per second. And actually, you can transmit the sense of touch through the 23 gigabits per second. This is going to be not just for robotics. This is also going to be smart cities, smart cars, and you name it. This is not just Google trying to drive a car without a driver. This will be a major, major piece of work over the next 20 years. 
The other thing we have done is similar to your phone. So normally during a lecture, people say, well, switch off the phone. Well, in the modern lecture, there are a number of you I can see taking photographs. You got your iPhones out. So, hey, look, take your phone out. How about take your phone out? Just humor me. Take your phones out, please. So you'll understand this. Just for a minute, Freddie, just imagine that your phone is a prostate cancer cell. Yeah? Your iPhone, your Samsung is a prostate cancer cell. So get the keyboard out uh, on your phone, just like you would answer an email. Yeah? And press the buttons B and C. Yeah? On the surface. Okay? Now each time you do that, there's a signal which goes inside your phone, doesn't it? So this is the principle of wind signaling. Imagine that keyboard to be a wind receptor. And each time you press on the wind receptor type 5A, you send a signal inside, which is either B or C, either beta-catenin or calcium. And beta-catenin translocates inside the prostate cancer cell, inside the nucleus, and kills the cell. So we are in the process of developing a number of wind molecules which will attach to the surface of the cell and kill the cell by wind signaling through beta-catenin and influx of calcium. So that's something else we have been doing and very excited about. So my final thoughts are how to integrate this with the BJUI. I've told you about science and clinical innovation. I've told you about science as in a lab which Many of you will do. A lab is a lab is a lab. But what about science in a journal? One of the challenges I had, apart from integrity, was making science understandable to surgeons. I mean, why should we just be seen as a bunch of carpenters? We are more than that. I've just shown you that we have brains. I've just shown you, just in case you are in any doubt, that we can improve our brains to perform better. But how can we take science closer to surgeons? Can we do that? A major challenge. And I think the answer is pretty simple. Make it simple and make it web-based. We want it to become the most read surgical journal on the web. So we had to change our leadership style. The previous leadership style was autocratic. John was highly respected, as I said, 60,000 people reading his blog. But it was very much what John said that worked. Today, we have established a democratic system within the BJUI, where I rely on editors for social media. I even have an editor for design. As Freddie knows, when Protect T came out last year, we featured Oxford on the front cover, and Freddie signed the editorial at a meeting of European urologists that we were in. We've actually changed it completely. I do not believe in lecturing to my editorial group. I hardly ever do meetings. I meet with them face to face at various places and I talk to them. I'm inspired by Steve Jobs, who did exactly the same, the Apple man. If you hear Steve talking about his leadership style, you can learn a lot from it. He says, I'm happy to be told I'm wrong. Really? Yes, absolutely. As a part of this, we realized that to be a good journal, we needed the highest level of evidence. Unlike European Urology, unlike the Journal of Urology, our two competitors and, dare I say, friends, we didn't have any society guidelines. Just none. The EAU guidelines are cited sometimes 350, 360 times. The Journal of Urology, the AUA guidelines are cited 70, 80, 100 times. We had no guidelines. We couldn't compete. Now, after two years of negotiations, we have the nice guidelines. We are featured. Next month, you will see the bladder cancer guidelines. Uh, this has been probably the creme de la creme for us, and it's taken me five years to get to this point. If you do not have the highest level of evidence today on the evidence triangle, which is guidelines, you can't compete. Guess what? JAMA featured 
the ASCO breast cancer screening guidelines already cited 500 times. But in order for surgeons to understand it, they had an infographic whereas a hand comes up and actually writes the guideline just like your teacher would write on a chalkboard. How effective is that? Are you saying you can't give two minutes of your time? You're so busy as surgeons. We have to make you understand the science because you're just too busy. Look, here is a lovely paper from Jack Schalken, a famous scientist in the Netherlands talking about uh, ERG and TEMPERS2. This is our fusion genes, uh, very common in prostate cancer. But if you put this, a highly cited paper, in front of a surgeon, I guarantee majority of you won't understand it. You may pretend just to humor me that you really get it. Yeah, we are in Oxford. We really understand uh, fusion. But the fact is, most of us in our hearts know we don't get it. So I got David Bostwick to write a science made simple, and we do this for most of our science articles. I tell them, write as though you're writing to children. <laughs> a simple diagram, write as though you're writing to a child who doesn't understand anything. So here is David's simple diagram where he shows where Tempers 2 is, he shows where ERG is, and it's either a deletion or a translocation. Even a two-year-old can understand that diagram. That is how I think we are going to attract science to surgeons, not just blustering you with science talk and expecting that you understand us. In fact, guess what? Most scientists did not understand the wind signaling pathway when I talked at Mount Sinai as visiting professor. And one of them came up afterwards saying, I've never heard such an analogy, congratulations. So the scientists also pretend, yes, we really love the science, we really get it. You don't, the technology is moving at a pace where we can't understand most of it. And it is our job as editors to make it accessible to you. If we are not, we are failing. Look at this, infographics. A picture is more than a thousand words. Again, all I need is two minutes of your time to look at a picture. Surely, you can give two minutes to understand the basics of PSMA PET scanning. This is very new, this is a hot topic, but most people can't be bothered because they don't have time to read the paper. And guess what? If you do this well, you become the only surgical journal to be in the altmetrics top 100, where number one is nature. The BJUI is the only surgical journal to feature in the altmetrics top 100 with a score of 1219. Most others have a score of 3 or 4. You could argue this is all nonsense. It doesn't matter. Well, it matters to nature, so it does matter to me. And we can argue whichever way we like it, but times they are changing. I've also become very cross-cultural. When I took over, we were only the journal to Baus, to uh, the uh, Swiss Continents Foundation, to the Indian Urological Society, and that was about it. The BJUI is now owned by 10 different societies. So I have realized that I have to learn how they speak, what their cultures are, understand what they want rather than tell them what I want in English. So it's been a great journey traveling around the world trying to understand these different cultures. So the other leadership style of cross-culture is very relevant in today's modern world. When I speak to the Chinese Urological Association, I always address them for the first five minutes in Mandarin. Yes, I have written it up. Yes, I have learned it. But I aim to do my best to achieve that. And finally, it has been transformational. We have completely changed uh, the way we are projecting ourselves. Thank you very much for having me, Freddie. Been a pleasure. Thank you.